welcome everybody to this event. Uh, it's been organised and hosted by us here at the Royal Historical Society, and my name is Emma Griffin, I'm the President of the Society. I'm really delighted to welcome so many of you both into the room here today and to our online audience as well. This evening's event is an opportunity to hear the distinguished Harvard Professor of Ukrainian History, Sir Harry Bobby, who will be discussing his new book, The Russo-Ukrainian War, with Professor Sir Richard Evans. We are really delighted to host Sir Harry Bobby in London this week to coincide with the publication of his book, which takes place today. The Russo-Ukrainian War is the comprehensive history of the war that has birthed since 2014 and that with Russia's attempt to seize Kiev in February 2022, destroyed the geopolitical order that had been in place since the end of the Cold War. For those of you in the room, if you would like to co purchase a copy of the book, copies will be available at the back of the room at the end of this event, and Sir Mark has very generously offered to sign them. I know some of you who are here tonight have been actively involved in supporting Ukraine in response to a shocking act of state aggression. In 2022, the RHS was pleased to co collaborate with a number of different scholarly organisations to fund seven Scholars at Risk fellowships to support Ukrainian scholars unable to continue their work at their home institutions. Uh, it's a particular pleasure for me uh, to welcome to the room uh, my colleague from UEA, Matthias Neumann, the President of Macy's, who was the originator behind this idea of the Matthias. Tonight, we're also very grateful uh, indeed to have Alicia Kromichuk, Director of the Ukrainian Institute of London, for making this event possible. Now, Alicia wants to provide a few words of welcome of her own, so I'll just head past over to Alicia for a moment. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. So, my name is Alicia Kromichuk, and I am a fellow of the Royal Historical Society, but I'm also the Director of the Ukrainian Institute London. The UEL is an independent charity, and we champion Ukrainian culture and try and shape the conversation about Ukraine in the UK and beyond. Uh, we engage experts, we engage creatives, policymakers, and just active citizens uh, to explore Ukrainian perspectives um, on global challenges. And with our program of public-facing events, educational courses, and digital content, we enable audiences around the world to access nuanced and reliable information about Ukraine. And it is this nuanced and reliable information on Ukraine that has been lacking for a very long time, and that has, and that Russia has exploited to its advantage. The complex and rich history of Ukraine has been weaponized by the Kremlin since the very start of the war in 2014, and continues to be weaponized to this day. And sadly, the international academic community was not always quick to counter the instrumentalization and weaponization of historical narratives coming out of Russia and very often entertain them as interpretations of history rather than um, a weapon of war. For instance, Putin's infamous essay was treated as problematic, but nevertheless an interpretation of history rather than a declaration of war. So, scholars like the people of Fee have done an amazing job at setting the record straight, not only countering Russia's weaponization, but also explaining Ukraine's history as an integral part of European history. As Russia continues to deny Ukraine's very existence, and as Ukraine continues to fight not only for its past, but most importantly, for its future, it is vital that we create platforms for discussions such as the one today. So I'm extremely grateful to the Royal Historical Society for partnering with UIL on this event and for hosting this conversation. I'm really looking forward to it. Thank you. to introduce Professor Bobby and Sir Richard. Sir Mark Bobby is Professor of Ukrainian History and Director of the Ukrainian Research Institute at Harvard University. He is one of the most widely known historians working today and the author of numerous studies on the history of Ukraine, <coughs> modern warfare and the Cold War. His books include Chernobyl, History of Tragedy, which won the Bailey Gifford the Christian House Book Prizes, The Gates of Europe, the History of Ukraine, and Lost the Kingdom, the History of Russian Nationalism, from Ivan the Great to Vladimir Putin, though in reality there are too many for me to, uh, to list. He has written many, many more books aside, and his work has been translated into many languages as well. In conversation with Sir this evening is Richard Day Evans, one of the world's leading historians of modern Germany and Europe. In 2008-2014, Sir Richard was Regis Professor of History at Cambridge University, and from 2010-2017, to 
President Wilson College, Cambridge. In 2000, he was the principal expert witness in the David Irving Holocaust denial life trial at the High Court in London, subsequently the subject of his book, Telling Lies About Hitler, 2002, and the film Denial. Sir Richard's many books include the acclaimed trilogy, The Coming of the Third Reich, <coughs> Third Reich of Power, and Third Reich of War. Thank you to both very much indeed, Professor Flogging and Sir Richard, for joining us tonight for conversation. Well, thank you very much, Emma. Thanks for inviting me. It's probably my own fault because I, I met Emma a few months ago and complained that since I became a fellow of the Royal Historical Society in 1978, the uh, Society never asked me to do anything at all. And so the result was she uh, asked me to do this. But it's a great pleasure to be able to uh, introduce and discuss with Sir Hay uh, his new book, which I much enjoy reading. Um, so I will really start by just asking you what did you hope to achieve by publishing this book? Uh, I'll think of this question and thanks, thanks for this invitation. It's, it's a real pleasure, pleasure to be here, pleasure and honor. And so Richard, you're, you're the first sir that I ever met in my life. <laughs> <laughs> Front of you. So, kind of a no pressure situation. Uh, the, what I wanted to achieve when, when I was writing this book, um, uh, I, I, I just felt that I had to do something, and uh, as uh, happened with me before, I got into the project not really realizing all its complexity because. The project was, I, I thought that as a historian, I would write about something that, that in March of 2022 were right there. And I also just mentioned Vladimir Putin's article and uh, misuse and abuse of history, and I was a historian, and that, that's, that's what I would, I would basically do. Uh, and uh, I wrote this book as a historian, but the book turned out to be the book of not just contemporary times, but of contemporary hours and minutes. And uh, uh, the, 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 the goal was actually uh, very simple at the end, to make sense out of something that made no sense at all. Because the, the, the first explanation that I had was, okay, it's, it's, it's madness. Uh, it, it wasn't supposed to happen. It wasn't supposed to happen on a number of levels, including the way how the Russia was unprepared for the war. The timing was was wrong from you know, many people in Ukraine were saying from the government. The timing was wrong for Putin because everyone in the world was watching him. So it made it no sense on a number of levels. And then, then what, what we all do, we try somehow to find the way of how to understand it, how to explain it. With the idea that not just provide an explanation for us today, but also somehow try to figure out what can happen next, how we should behave. So, again, that's, that's the, 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 the idea. What, what I was doing with that book was a long. And um, this is a very contemporary history. Among other things, I'm co editor of the Journal of Contemporary History, and it's a constantly recurring <coughs> problem. How do you write? The history of uh, right up to the minute. Will things change and, and falsify what you've been saying? How can you achieve a reasonably scholarly and objective account when you don't have access to more than a very small amount of these sources? And of course, you have very strong views on the issues. Can you reconcile this with scholarship? Uh, Yes, I can. What it is really an enormous, enormous challenge. I started as a historian of 16th, 17th century, and those were uh, really the safest times in my career in the sense that no one could stand up in the audience and say, "Okay, I was there, and you got this absolutely." <laughs> And uh, uh, with, with moving closer to the 20th century now to contemporary developments, you really, you really are exposed to, to that sort of 
challenges and, and questions. And uh, also, about tomorrow, there will be some another revelation interview with somebody or, or some document would, would uh, mm, uh, come up. And uh, uh, the question is whether whether you you were able to, to write it in the way that that new document would actually not challenge what, what, what you are saying. So you have to be actually super conservative to a degree, much more conservative in making all sorts of uh, projections or reconstructions than when you work on the 16th century. Because in the 16th century, anyone who can challenge you is someone like, like, like yourself. Not, not the witness of it. It's probably really new, new sort of documents, new, new type of documents. So you have to be, you have to be quite, quite conservative in that sense. And uh, then a big, big, really challenge to figure out. It's so important what we just read earlier today in the morning about this counteroffensive or that counteroffensive. <laughs> But the chances are that uh, two weeks from now, maybe three months from now, that would not be worse even a footnote again in, in a broader and in, in general book. So what I'm doing now, I'm listening to the challenges, right? And I'm not providing the answer to actual question. How, <laughs> how do you deal with that? We as historians are trained to really to, to look at sources critically. There is, there is a number of levels of how, how you, you deal with, with the sources. And I try to do that to the best of my ability in these conditions. And what we see in this war, this war is very much fought in, the, uh, in, in social media, more than any other war which surprisingly now created actually better opportunities and provided maybe an excuse for people like me who write about, about this war today to a degree that writing about the World War II in 1939 or 1940 would be really impossible because, because of, the, of the control of the, of the newspaper, the control of the media, and now there is so much things out there on the line, so it's an abundance to a degree of sources coming to the fore within, within just a few minutes, if not seconds, after the event, and that brings a new challenge. With all this ocean of, of information, how you figure out what is important, how you, how you do the critique of your sources. But again, the, 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 maybe the short answer is that this is, in some way, the book I define it as the war that is fought with the 19th century ideology, 20th century tactics and uh, 21st century weapons and, and cyber warfare, but also involvement of the society as a whole. So that, that helps write in, in, in real time the, the, the story of the current war. It creates also a new set of issues that maybe we didn't have before. And um, as a historian, of course, uh, as we all do uh, in contrast to journalists, you take the long view. So it's not until nearly halfway through the book that we actually get to the war. And you go right back into the Middle Ages, and back to your original, original uh, period. So the question that it all throws up is, when did Ukrainian national consciousness form itself? When did the idea of Ukraine and Ukrainians as a separate nation Again, was this in the 20th century, or was it earlier, or was it only during the current war? Yeah. Um, yes, you can, uh, if you're formed as early modernist, you can run, but you cannot hide. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but um, in, in, in this particular case, uh, I uh, had to start early. In, in medieval times, because the war started under, under pretext and started with this pseudo historical essay about historical unity of Russian, Russians and Ukrainians, where Putin was really going to the Middle Ages. So uh, I, I found that even if I would be trained as a historian of the 21st century, 
to deal appropriately with the, with the context of the war. I would have to go. I would have to go. Um, then, then where does the war start in the book? Uh, it starts much earlier than the middle of the book. Because one of the arguments that I make in there is that the war didn't start in February of 2022. The war started in February of 2014. And this eight years turned out to be crucial also in, in, in many ways in the way how this latest information of the war turned out. Uh, now about, about the, the, the Ukrainian nation. Um, Ukrainians, of course, uh, uh, proud to have as their capital the capital of the Kievan Rus, the, the medieval empire that controlled a good part of Europe. The uh, court of arms of Ukraine is the court of arms of the early Kievan princes. So, in that sense, they're, they're endowed uh, maybe more than other neighboring groups around them with a sort of the quote unquote glorious past, or at least at least a big past, a sort of a golden age that is needed for the, for the formation, for the building of modern national identity. But when you turn to the modern national identity, this is very much the story of, of uh, Eastern Europe, or maybe Europe in general. It is 19th century, where you start to integrate into whatever the ideas of nation there is. The, 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 the lower the lower groups of the society. So the, the modern national, or Ukrainian national project comes to the fore in the 1840s, uh, in the wake of the Polish uprising against the Russian Empire. And what you see there is actually a continuation of the development of that project, from the idea of the Slavic Federation, European Federation, to the idea of the, of the full independence of the country by the turn of the 20th century, and five attempts in the 20th century to declare independence. The fifth in 1991 came successful, and what you see with this war is actually an attempt to turn history back to the, to the 19th century, to, 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 to the period before all of these five, five attempts on Ukrainians to, to acquire a state of their own. So, uh, how far was Ukrainian national identity tied to back? So we're talking about 19th century, yeah. and um, almost without exception, only the, maybe there were exceptions, Rory, uh, maybe we're correct. But generally, what you see is the is the nations that emerge not out of the position of power in a particular empire. But they emerge on the basis of a linguistic map. And today's territory of Ukraine, plus minus, is the linguistic map of the 19th century. So the, 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 the territory that was settled where the majority of the population were people that according to the linguists of the 19th century spoke the language that they defined as, or would, would be defined today as Ukraine. And then the, the idea is how to, how you, to, Turn this linguistic map into the into the uh, map of a polity, because almost no other polities that existed on the territory were based on the, on the linguistic maps. Ukrainian case is very interesting. That by the time when from the fifth of the town, Ukraine got its independence within the borders that roughly and roughly were based on the linguistic map of the 19th century. The actual linguistic map was already quite different. With the level of Russification of the 20th century, the, 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 the industrialization that brought to Ukraine uh, people like Khrushchev and, and Brezhnev, the, the uh, uh, sons of the peasant families from southern Russia who came to Ukraine for job, for work, Ukraine really emerged in 1991 as a, as a very much bilingual nation. Would be probably even more than bilingual, trilingual, if there would be no World War II and Holocaust and, and deportation of the Poles and deportation of the Crimean Tatars and so on and so forth. But the World War II changed the landscape in terms of ethnicity and language to really create this bilingual situation. So the, 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 the Ukraine of 1991 and Ukraine that fights uh, today is fighting for the borders 
of identity based on 19th century math is the sort of identity that is not linked exclusively to the language. Mm -hmm. And the war is fought today on the Ukrainian side as much uh, in, in Ukraine as it is fought in Russia. Right, and so how do you explain then the Ukrainian resistance to the Russian invasion? Which is also, of course, among with some, uh, a large number of Russian speakers as well as Ukrainian speakers. Um, uh, my explanation is uh, basically the explanation that was provided in a recent book, The Zelensky Effect, by Olga Oluch and Henry Hale. And that's about, about uh, the creation of a civic nation. Uh, Ukraine, after all, is the only country in the world outside of Israel led by a president of a Jewish background. Um, so it is, it, it, is, it is about civic identity, and uh, sometimes I, I almost look at Ukraine and what is happening there. And that, okay, we keep writing in, 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 in articles and books about such phenomenon as, as a political or civic nation. Uh, but then it turns out that there is no place on the earth where you could actually go and see how that civic nation looks like. And it looks like I found one place on the earth where you can go and see more or less what is, what is happening. This is Ukraine. Because if you ask Ukrainian today, and uh, that that's, comes again and again in numerous interviews, put it on the front, front lines, what you are fighting for, that the sort of the answer would go over the issue of freedom and values. It's, 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 uh, it's uh, true in its own right, but also if you look at the, at the uh, options that are there, you can't say that you are fighting for one language, you can't say that you are fighting for one religion. You can, you, a, number, a number of these options that normally exist, they don't exist. So it is about patriotism and it is about the, the, the political nations and loyalty to the institutions. Because people are again saying, well, why do you want Russians to be here again? Okay, we want to have the right to elect or not to elect people who we, who we want to have here. And that's, that's on, the, on, the, on the very, very basic level. So, um, yeah, my explanation is not maybe very, very original in terms of what you see there. But we really see really in, in, the, in, the, in the world history a political nation, a civic nation being manifesting itself in, in such a way and showing such a resilience uh, to, the, to the aggression and to the ideology that is linked with the old-fashioned thinking about nation based on, on language because Putin came to Ukraine allegedly to liberate uh, uh, Russians and Russian speakers uh, by killing them disproportionately compared to, 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 to the rest of the population because the city of Mariupol that is barely exists today, uh, the absolute majority of, of it was a Russian speaking city, but 44% of the population are in Russians. And um, it's, as you mentioned, it's, um, it's uh, quite common in seeing national, nationalism arise in the 19th century and, and later too, to find that religion is an important factor in driving national identity, but you don't mention this very much in your book. Is that because it's not important? And if it's not important, why is it not important in this case? Uh, well, one more disclosure. It's not only that I started writing on the 16th century. I started also writing on the, on the relations between uh, Western Christianity and Eastern Christianity and the creation of a hybrid church in Ukraine that became known as Greek Catholic Church. So Ukraine is a place that, in religious terms, uh, is divided by the division of the Roman Empire. So that division is, is present in Ukraine, in Ukraine today. And Ukraine has been struggling, at least since the 16th century, to bridge the divide, of, of, to, 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 to deal with the split of the Roman Empire in its own way, but by from forming a church that would, would be a sort of a hybrid church with dogmas and, and, and jurisdiction associated with Rome and with the right associated with uh, East and Eastern patriarchs. 
So um, there are there is more than one national church in there today in Ukraine. It's one Orthodox, another 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 Greek Catholic. You look at the at the uh, Ukraine back in, before ninety one during the Soviet times. It was also part of the Bible Belt of the Soviet Union till the beginning of the of this uh, century. The Moscow Patriarchate had more parishes in Ukraine than it had in Russia. So religion is a huge, huge part of, of Ukrainian experience. And the aggression <laughs> was there to actually try to, to create conflict between uh, Russians and Ukrainians, Russian-speaking Ukrainians, speaking Greek Catholics and Orthodox. And they failed. But the religion from that point of view, again, it's not something mobilizing that we are fighting against against uh, pe pe people of a, of, of, a different, of a different religious uh, tradition. So it, it, it doesn't have this mobilizing power that, again, language doesn't have that power, religion doesn't have that power, ethnicity doesn't have that power. And uh, did this war already in the second year, and there were two, two uh, Orthodox sisters in between, and the, the, on, on both of them, if I'm not mistaken, uh, uh, Russia, who is there to defend traditional Orthodox uh, uh, values, was continuing to with Ukraine, which of course created all sorts of discussions in, in Ukrainian social media and so on and so forth about, about the, the, the role of Orthodox in, in two societies. Um, and you, you uh, don't mention the problem of corruption uh, in the uh, Ukrainian political system, apart from <coughs> the extent to which it has an influence on weakening particularly Ukrainian intelligence services, subversion from Russia. Is corruption still a problem, or has it just been swept under the carpet by the greater urgency of the war? Has Zelensky actually tried to think about it? Um, there is one more chapter. <laughs> 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 this, uh, this, uh, the, the uh, um, Ukraine after 2014, and Poroshenko's, Poroshenko's presidency after 2014, and the first two years being, being quite successful in, in dealing with the corruption, um, and then, then the successes were less prominent. Now, um, well, you do accuse Poroshenko of complacency about corruption. I, 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 I'm not accusing, I'm just stating that that's... You're very right, I'm not that's, entirely unjustified. Yeah, so, I, um, and uh, clearly his, his uh, loss in the elections to Zelensky and the rise of Zelensky is a very much story, if not about corruption per se, then at least about the uh, perception of um, now, um, uh, what is happening with this war? It puts um, the, the Ukraine's problem with corruption in a um, particular context and in places that in, in, in its place. Because uh, the, the, if Ukraine would be the corrupt state on the level that everyone was talking about that and discussing it, there would be no Ukraine today. Uh, the Ukrainian people would not support that state and would not support those, those leaders. One thing that happened uh, was after 2014 was this decentralization, uh, uh, decentralization uh, program in Ukraine where the localities received much more power, much more money. And uh, people were rallying around the mayors. Mayors became one of the biggest heroes of, 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 of the first months of the war. They were kidnapped by the Russians. They were tortured, and so on and so forth. So everyone expected that the, the, uh, if, if, you read, if you read media and coverage and analysis of Ukraine before the war, it's a corrupt society, the, the, the fa failed state. And, 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 and so on and so forth. And now this society actually is united, and this allegedly failed state is, is, is functioning uh, under the constant attacks and bombardment. So the argument is not that the corruption is not there, 
But clearly, when we were talking about corruption before that, we certainly didn't understand something about it, and certainly probably exaggerated its its um, its importance. Now, in terms of anti-corruption campaigns, there was one during the Poroshenko's period when Ukraine was really in receiver, uh, re receivership, so the Western granting institutions and Ukrainian civil society applied pressure on Poroshenko, uh, and I'm looking at uh, Andrew Wilson and trying to figure out what I'm, I'm, I'm saying, <laughs> more or less, things, how they were or not. And uh, then the second period was when Zelensky came on this really anti-corruption wave and started doing things that, from my perspective, then were absolutely crazy. He was he went after the richest man in, in Ukraine, Mr. Rachmetov, uh, right before the start of the war. He opened another front on on uh, Mr. Poroshenko, who wasn't the richest man but was one of the representatives of oligarchic system. He passed a law uh, defining what the oligarch is and, and what uh, and, and took away the the TV channels from. Uh, um, uh, Mr. Medvedchuk, a uh, close, close ally of, of Putin, and that, that, that was, that was uh, at least one of the theories why, why the crisis in April of 2021 20, uh, started. Uh, and I think that basically this war and what is happening now strengthened Zelensky hand in fighting, in fighting the corruption. So what, what, what will happen next, I don't know. But Ukraine today, in that sense, is, is a much, in a much better position than it was in, in the previous you know, 10 years or something like that. And Putin has accused the Ukrainian state of being <coughs> fascist and what he calls Banderist, which is a reference to Stepan Bandera, the pro Nazi leader of the Ukrainian resistance to the Soviet Union. Um, how important is the role of neo-fascism or the old-fashioned fascism in Ukraine? If you take the Azov Battalion, for example, um, that's, that's being accused of being much of a kind of fascist unit within the Ukrainian army. Yes, uh, I, I, I will be very clear. Uh, not important at all. Not important at all. Um, uh, uh, let's look at the, the Ukrainian parliament. In Ukrainian parliament, to the middle of the war, under the outside attack, there was no one single nationalist party. They just never crossed the 5% threshold. Look at the rest of Europe. Count the not just not just members, <coughs> but the, the, the parties. Look about look at the presidential elections in some of the countries. You will see the right really really and nationalism is very strong there. In Ukraine, they couldn't get into the parliament in the middle of the war. Uh, why? I have a couple of theories. But that's, that's, for me, as a historian, is the, the most important question. Why we see this? Why we see Zelensky being the president? When, uh, when uh, we don't see, we don't see uh, uh, leaders of Jewish backgrounds in, in other countries. Now, uh, uh, Azov Battalion. Azov Battalion was formed back in 2014 with the uh, help and under the leadership of uh, nationalists. Some radical nationalists. Since the fall of 2014, they were integrated into the into the not Ukrainian army, but they were integrated into the uh, national guard that is fighting now. So the, the leadership changed during that the, the, that entire period completely. Uh, the, the, I, I specifically was looking at the latest literature on that, uh, which convinced me that uh, what the, the, the beginnings were indeed radical nationalism, but those beginnings are, 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 are in the past. So even if they're not in the past again, things can change tomorrow, something else will happen. The big story is that we don't have a good explanation how Ukraine can fight this war. Is nationalism 
again, I'm looking at the author of the book, the <coughs> my minority faith. I don't think, maybe I'm wrong, I don't think that much, much, much changed since the 1990s. Ukrainian nationalism, that radical understanding of the term, remains to be a minority faith since, since 1991. Uh, what we see is this war is really the rise of patriotism. Again, not to say nationalism doesn't exist, radical nationalism doesn't exist, not to say that it doesn't have influence, but the big question is why it's so, so not influential compared to what is happening in, in, in the neighborhood as a whole. Yeah, I think that's probably right. I mean, I was asked uh, after the Russian invasion by a group of Americans joined the Holocaust to sign a statement of support. Uh, for Ukraine, but I refuse because uh, there's, they've got two lengthy paragraphs in the middle referring to Ukrainian fascism, help of the Germans in the war, and I just thought that was inappropriate. Um, so I, I agree with absolutely with your point that it's, it exists, but it's not very important, it's not less important as the war's going on. Um, now, uh, I'm going to move on to is a word of future. You um, have some uh, prognostications. I've always been very wary of historians predicting the future ever since I published a book in 1989 saying that German unification was not going to happen in my life. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you have to go anyway. And uh, the first thing you're saying is that the war has shaken Putin's hold on Russia. Uh, public support is declining. Uh, now, I don't see that happening. What's your justification of the saying that? His grip seems to be as tight as ever. No, the propaganda coming from Russian media seems to, according to reports I've read, be swallowed by the vast majority of the Russian population. Uh, first about uh, prognostication right, of the future. Um, I didn't know that you had that experience with the reunification. <laughs> but I. I Try to predict future uh, just long term with the idea that I would not be around. <laughs> if, if something goes goes wrong, and I'm, I'm, I'm very very careful making no prognosis for the, for the immediate future. And the long term future uh, for me, it's it's uh, um, like I I I, I have easy way of, of betting on a particular sort of a future. Because I look at this war through the prism of the many wars of the imperial collapse in this situation. Mm -hmm. And uh, we know the trend. We know the way, way it goes. Something can, can change? Absolutely. New trends emerge. But this is a pretty safe bet, especially when it is a long term one. And it, it, it also helped me to, to put many things and, and think about, about this war in, in, in the way that maybe normally that this long-term perspective that normally maybe people people don't don't discuss. Uh, about Putin and his grip grip on the Russian society, this is more like a constatation of fact, it is the fact how I understand it and how what, it's, it's a very tricky business of, of course, doing Poland in today's Russia. But people who understand something about Poland saying that, yes, the majority still supports the war, but the numbers actually are uh, What we see, again, the war, as I said, is, is fought also on the, in, in the social media. Uh, I just can't interpret that as the Putin's strong position, strengthening of his position, where publicly uh, the head of his private army, Prigozhin, is attacking <coughs> the, the commanders of, of, of the state army and, 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 and vice versa. Um, I uh, certainly that there is that there is a number of ways to look at the at the fact of the Russian immigration, which is the largest since the revolution of 1917. But again, at least I look at that not only as the people critical of the regime are leaving, but also that they're reflecting, reflecting particular tendencies in, in the regime. The, the formation, very loose formation of the opposition uh, was, again, not very strong, but, but still the formation of the opposition is certainly not 
not good news for the for uh, for Putin and, and, and his regime. Uh, uh, so um, yes, he, he still is capable to fight the war. He still is capable to 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 mobilize uh, the Russians and to send them to the to the uh, um, killing fields of Ukraine. Uh, but uh, I, I just can't say that his position today is stronger than it was on the early morning of February 24th, 2022. Okay, um, and uh, uh, I mean, optimism is one of the characteristics of your, your book. You're generally very optimistic. And the Ukrainian army depends now very heavily on Western supplies of modern, advanced military technology. I read somewhere that every time a Ukrainian army unit uh, last year fired uh, a missile at the, at the Russians, the, the people on the, on the firing line said, uh, God save the Queen, that's the missile. <laughs> so foreign arms supplies, foreign backing, sanctions, all the rest of it is very, really very important. So it's, a, it's perfectly plausible to, to think that Next year, Donald Trump will be elected president of the USA. Neck and neck, something like that in the opinion polls. Uh, Biden is widely unpopular, and uh, Trump is, is rallying people behind him and have an enormous appeal. And as soon as he becomes president, he will stop uh, military supplies, he'll cancel sanctions, he will swing round behind his friend Putin. In that sense, it doesn't look as if Ukraine will be able to carry on. Now that's a kind of gloomy scenario that, uh, that, I, that I, <laughs> I prefer in a way, maybe it's just the way I am. But it's perfectly uh, possible that that is going to happen. Uh, what, do you, what do you think will happen after the next presidential elections? Is that going to be likely if somebody else uh, on the Republican side comes into the White House? Uh, a similar kind of scenario is likely to happen. Or are you more optimistic as you are in the book? Well, uh, apart from what say between people who are also sending thanks to Boris Johnson who became a yes. big hero in Ukraine exactly at the time when he was, <laughs> you know, he was becoming less and less popular in the UK. So it's, 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 it's interesting. That's why he went so often. <laughs> um, I don't know whether, whether anything was named after Boris Johnson. So Cakes. Cakes. Oh, well, there you go. Um, nothing after Trump, right? Uh, but uh, uh, one thing that we, uh, at least those who, who want to stay half optimistic, uh, one thing that is worth remembering that Mr. Trump got into his first impeachment over the issue of providing arms to Ukraine, something that his predecessor, Barack Obama, refused to do, and something that uh, uh, Trump himself was not actually eager to do, he was trying to take a political bribe for the government. But he couldn't, he couldn't actually stop the, the, the delivery of those weapons that was, that, that, that was voted by the, by the Congress. And uh, um, anything can happen in the Congress. But what I see as a historian that for the first time since the end of the Cold War, and since the time of, of my, me being in the United States, which is now 15, 16 years, Republicans and Democrats, at least the majority of them, found miraculously one issue on which they can agree, and that's, that's Ukraine. Of course, there is a criticism on the, on the uh, uh, one side of the Democratic Party and on the other side of the, of the Republican Party. There is continuing to be enormous public support for, for Ukraine. Um, I, I think about that as, as to a degree that the Americans think about this war as sort of a good war, the closest to World War II, where the moral clarity is there, where it's very clear where is the right side, where is the wrong side. 
and uh, politicians follow. Some politicians lead, other politicians follow. So uh, I certainly, I certainly found more than enough ground for for, for being optimistic, not not over optimistic. But uh, again, I would I would bet on the on the U.S. continuing support for Ukraine, whoever is in the White House. Well, let's hope you're right. Um, so thank you very much. Congratulations on the book again. And now we've got time for questions from the floor. I'll just stick a hand up. Yeah. In 2014, um, the Russian attack on the Russian army was experienced after wars in Chechnya and Georgia, and it took Crimea very, very easily. And the Ukrainian army seemed to collapse very quickly. And yet, this time around, 28 years later, there seems to be a remarkable reversal. A, a much more nimble, much more imaginative enterprise in the Ukrainian army, a much more uh, limited, wandering, rather simplistic approach by the Russians. Do you have an explanation for the change that's obviously taken place in those eight years? This is the thing, a great question. The, 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 the short answer is whoever doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And uh, clearly, the, the 2014 sent a very clear message to the to the uh, uh, Ukrainian government and the Ukrainian society that that they have to have an army. In 2014, they had no army. And speaking about corruption, they existed on paper entire detachments that were paid for, for allegedly serving, but not in yeah. practice, they they, they they didn't exist. Um, and uh, uh, another another important fact was, of course, the, the um, uh, Western assistance. Uh, the the Ukrainian army still was fighting with the Soviet era equipment. They, they ran out of it last May, and now it's it's up to almost 100 percent. It's, it's the, the, the Western the Western supplies. Uh, but uh, they, they were also going through training. <coughs> exercise and so on and so forth, trying to, to adopt some latest elements. Before the start of the war, there was a numerous panels on how the war would play. I didn't encounter them, all this would be about military aspect of the United States. And I don't remember anyone even mentioning the existence of the and it's, 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 it's difficult to believe that the, 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 most of them specialize in, 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 in the Russian, Russian capabilities. But also, the war started a few months after the complete implosion of the Afghan army that was trained, supplied uh, ten, 10 times more than, than the Ukrainian, and then it disappeared overnight. So, no one knew, no one counted on what, what would be there. The, the, uh, expectation was that there would be basically both in, in Moscow and in Washington that there would be some groups in, in, in Russia they called nationalist battalions in, 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 in uh, the US they were thinking about the veterans of the, of the Donbass war that would resist with stingers and, and, and laws and laws and, and so on and so forth but uh, eight years turned out to be a really really important period in terms of the really building not even with the Ukrainian army, and huge transformations in the Ukrainian society. Putin's mistake, apart from writing bad history, was, was that he attacked Ukraine in 2022, Ukraine in 2014. So the, the, the eight years, the eight years of transformation of the state of the society, the relationship between between the, the, the state and society, the, the armed forces, between armed forces and people, would change dramatically. So without without 2014, there would be no resistance. Another question, Jeffrey. I want to think that struck me about Ukraine since 1991 is the strength, really, of civil society organizations. Uh, this is very different from Russia, where civil society uh, it's obviously rather weak, but it was uh, it, it was exemplified particularly in I think it was 2004 when the falsified election was actually shown up and had to be reversed uh, later in the year. 
Um, so what do you attribute the strength of Ukrainian civil society when compared to Russia? Um, there, there, there is uh, one chapter in this book that I'm particularly proud of. It's, it's, it's chapter two. It's called um, it's called um, um, democracy and autocracy, autocracy and democracy, and it, it's it's a parallel I look at developments in Russia and Ukraine um, because 1990. That's that's uh, again those of us who were around at that time were looking at Yeltsin on the tank and, and Russian democracy. That's that 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 was the beacon of hope. And Ukraine was run by more conservative apparatchiks like Kravchuk. But by the beginning of the of, the, of this of this century, the situation completely changed. So Russia went very strongly authoritarian path. Uh, Yeltsin was used tanks against the same power that he uh, defended uh, two years earlier. When in Ukraine they were trying really hard, I mean the, the elites, to follow the Russian model. And they were getting they were getting pushed back. People were shown on the street. So at the end of his of his tenure as the president, Lenin Kuchuk, who oh, sorry sorry Lenin Kuchma, the second Ukrainian president, who, who was there at the time of the Orange Revolution of 2004, uh, published a book which called uh, the, the name was uh, Ukraine is not Russia. And the book was launched not in Ukrainian first, but in Russian, and not in Kiev, but in Moscow. Basically, sent in Moscow uh, uh, the signal that, guys, I tried. <laughs> <laughs> Ukraine is not Russia. It, it, it doesn't work. And um, the, the, the political scientists probably will provide a lot, a lot of very good explanations. I look at that as, as a historian. And what you see in Russia is basically a story of really close association of elites and people in general with the idea of the state. And what you see in Ukraine is actually the, 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 the most onerous thing is actually the rebel against the state. The state is always foreign. The, 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 how you undermine the state? That's, <laughs> That's basically what the Ukrainians for generations were waking up with that idea and with that thought. And um, the, the events of 2013, 2014, it started as a revolution, Euro, Euro revolution. Uh, but it became mass when actually the, the uh, police uh, dispersed and, and beaten up students. People immediately showed on the streets. In Russia, they actually leave the streets and go go to their homes. In Ukraine, they left their homes and went to the streets when the police brutality demonstrated itself. So, as a historian, I just look at that as, as about different different basically historical relationship with the state. But this is just one of many ways to explain. Uh, next question. Yes. Thank you for the fascinating discussion. Uh, so here you wrote two important books on nuclear history, that's Chernobyl and Atoms to Ashes, and of course nuclear is a very important um, dimension of this war. And you have emphasized countless amount of times that Russia is the first country in history to occupy a site of civilian nuclear infrastructure in uh, the British nuclear power plant. So I'm just uh, curious to hear your thoughts what this war means for the future and for the present of nuclear energy and of nuclear disarmament. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And yeah, we both come from the bridge, so it's, it's really <laughs> close, uh, close, close to go. Um, mm, well, uh, the, 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 there are two tendencies that emerged during this war. On the one hand, with sanctions against Russia and uh, trying to cut dependency in Europe on Russian oil and gas, uh, nuclear emerged emerged as a potential solution, a possible solution. And everyone is saying I think, how stupid the Germans were, just uh, uh, closing uh, closing that chapter in their energy history. On the other hand, what we got first was the takeover of Chernobyl. Because the, then the Parisian nuclear power plant, the war happening in the Parisian nuclear power plant. Now counteroffensive is coming. 
you know that Ukrainians will already try and once to retake the, the, the nuclear power plant. We don't know what will happen now. The problem is that we, as, 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 as humankind, are basically once again caught by surprise by the developments of things. We don't have, we don't have even plan, no plan whatsoever how to deal with that situation. The, the last, the last uh, international agreement dealing with the uh, war at the nuclear power plant comes from the late 1960s and treats nuclear power plants on par with the, with the uh, dikes and, and, and hydroelectric power stations. We are not equipped in terms of institutional. The International Atomic Energy Agency in their statements would not pronounce the word Russia for the first two or three weeks of the of the war, just calling on the both sides to exercise to exercise the caution, because the, the the election of the next leader of the International Atomic Energy Agency depends on, on the vote of the Russia, the paycheck of a good part of people who work there depends on the Russian contribution. So the, the, the structures are not there, and at the same time, none of the 440 reactors were actually designed in a way that could actually be in the war zone, there is no, there is no instructions to the, to the staff, there is no understanding on the part of the defenders of those nuclear power plants, whether they uh, commit the, the act of treason when they lay down weapons as they did at Chernobyl, or they are heroes like they did at Zaporizhia, or maybe they are criminals because they resist and the war comes and the, the, they and their families and, 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 and uh, half of the country can be blown up. So it's, we are completely in uncharted waters, and uh, the, the, the only thing that I can say is, uh, I, 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 I said that in, in, in economists, in, in one of those articles that they have on invitation, that uh, we really have no business of building new nuclear reactors before we find the way how to, how to protect the existing one. So, as a minimum, we need to we face a major international treaty and make the uh, attacks on the nuclear power plants as much of a taboo as the use of the nuclear weapons is today. Because there, is the, there, is, there are differences, but at the end of the day, there is no difference. But it's atoms for peace or atoms for, for, for war that, that get to happen. Uh, I wonder if I can take you back to uh, last, last year and the start of the war. Uh, back in 91, it was already inside the Russian leadership. A lot of talk about the redrawing of the boundaries of Mother Russia, Kazakhstan, Estonia, but above all, Crimea. So it's not as if, it's not as if it's a new a new factor in, in high politics in Russia. What do you think was the, the main trigger for the war precisely in 22, in 2022? Um, yes, uh, well, first of all, <coughs> first of all I, I, I agree with the you said. Um, the the um, Russian idea from very <coughs> around Yeltsin, already immediately after the coup was, okay guys, you can keep the borders that you have if you are part of whatever arrangement that, that we are in, either union for the for Gorbachev or for some form of confederation for, for Yeltsin. But if you, are, if, you are, if you are trying to get out, then we are questioning your borders. And um, but the, the idea was that, uh, and formulated again at that time, we don't really need that from us, we don't need that great really. deal. What we need is Ukraine, what we need Kazakhstan. We are prepared to, to, to play this, this borders card, to achieve our goal. That's how the 20, 2014 starts. 2014, the war starts over the issue of the association agreement, Ukraine's association agreement with Europe. Not NATO, not membership in the European Union Association Agreement. Because if Ukraine signs the Association Agreement, uh, it couldn't join the Eurasian Union. 
the uh, revolution of dignity actually brings to the power the government that was committed to signing an association agreement with the European Union. And Putin moves in basically now using, using the, the Crimea card, the annexation, the plan B now becomes plan A. And the same story in 2022. The, the main attack is on Kiev. The prize is Kiev. The prize is Ukraine. Once you don't get there, you try to grab whatever you can in territorial terms. So now to the, to, 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 to the question itself. What, what was the main trigger? Um, uh, my understanding is that that's from, from reading Putin's put article on the Russian citizens. There were big hopes that uh, the, the Minsk agreements, the way how they envisioned by Russia, would make Ukraine ungovernable and would stop its drift over the West. It didn't happen under Poroshenko. The hope was, okay, there is Zelensky, the guy who was running on the, on the peace platform, saying, okay, the most important thing is stop shooting. Zelensky comes to, 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 to uh, uh, power, and over some period of time, he first tries to, to accommodate the Russians. There is another, another Maidan, another revolution growing in Ukraine. He turns around, he takes even more radical position to let integration into Europe than most Poroshenko. So Putin's general thinking, I, uh, again, judging by this article, and this article, is, as I said, that was a declaration of war, is that he was running out of time. And in the article he writes that the West introduced into Ukraine this awful system, which is democracy, he doesn't use the word. The governments change, people change, but then it just over Russia continue. So uh, the, 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 uh, that he denounces Minsk agreements, denounces Minsk agreements that opens doors to, uh, door for the world. So that's that's rational explanation. But what I learned, learned from, from this war is that the rational explanations are not the best explanations quite often because again, it was it wasn't very rational, at least from my point of view at the time and the way how it was done was not rational. Yeah. <coughs> um, I was just wondering about your approach to writing on such an emotive subject like this. I mean was it's clearly motivation for, for I think for you and for everyone in Eastern Europe. And I was wondering whether that was something you embraced when writing about the subject or something you tried to get past. Equally, when writing about the war, did you feel you could ever be close to being an impartial historian on it? Or did you feel more like a political current affairs commentator, if that makes sense? Well, uh, uh, I have written about the war since 1991. Believed and believe today that this war is criminal, and I just refused to compromise on that, and and, and try to, to just embrace the, the, the position that that okay it, it, it was somehow justified. Uh, but uh, once once this platform is there. Uh, then, then I, I, I'm trying to be as, uh, as objective as possible, trying to, to provide the best answer I can how it came to the world, why it started, trying to provide the best answer I can to the question of why the, the uh, Ukrainian, U, Ukrainian defenses collapsed in 2014. So dealing with a specific question and asking question why while telling also to the story of how. And that's where I don't think I'm, I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm biased, maybe I am, but that's, that's not something, the level of bias is not on the level that I, 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 I feel it or feel that I have somehow. But in terms of the, of the, of the um, general, general attitude on whose side I am, um, yes, I, I know that, I know write about that, but I really hope, again, I don't know, you do things, you think about them one way, and the other people look at that, see something else. 
I really hope that in that book I, I, I come across as the person who tries to do the best job possible as a historian. I mean, that echoes <coughs> my, my experience in writing uh, about Nazi Germany. Um, when you take the point of view that what you need to do is to explain and understand uh, rather than to condemn, then you, that's the, the door to writing what you might call an objective history, a history in conformity with the evidence. Yes. May I ask a follow up question sort of related to the previous one? <coughs> By the Royal Historian, the Historical Society, and most of us here are historians, and many of us here are historians of the region. And it's flattering to think that historians can be somehow superhuman and remain objective in the middle of a genocidal war. Um, I think the obvious answer is that we, we can't, and perhaps we shouldn't either, and that is what you articulate so well. Um, the question I have is have the historians of the region in particular done enough? Uh, to draw attention to our expertise of the region and Russia as it was becoming more and more aggressive, and do you see enough being done at the moment to decolonize the field? Oh, uh, yes, uh, thank you. It's an it's, um, um, interesting, interesting situation with this war. I don't know, maybe with others as well, but I wasn't kind of involved in coverage of the previous war to a degree. But, uh, uh, I feel like the, the, uh, the, the, there is this, this uh, demand for, for the historical knowledge, apart from, of course, uh, interviewing the, the retired generals and so on and so forth, uh, that uh, I, 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 it, it looks like that historians are really high profile commentators on this world. Tim Snyder, an Applebaum journalist writing history to a degree that maybe our political science colleagues are not, don't, don't have that star status or power. And um, that's, that's my question. I don't know what that means. I don't know whether, whether this is correct or I just recognize in the media the names that people who I know and ignore the rest. But this is definitely my feeling. That, and the war started. History is written all over this war, from from the from uh, uh, from the way how Putin frames it to a degree that that bad history influences his own decisions, to the to the major impact of that I discussed that on on the, on the international order. So there is a lot of history there. Now historians of, of the region, um, um, and, and and from Ukraine in particular. Uh, what I see again, the, the historians are very important to discuss in the war in Ukraine as well. It's Kapravda and, and not only. But most, most important impact of the war uh, in terms of the historical profession, I still basically, we, we will see maybe 5, 10, 15 years from now. Because uh, unprecedented number of, of uh, historians and very interestingly, in particular women, who otherwise probably would not be in the, um, uh, in the universities and temporary positions in Europe, in the US, in Canada, in the UK probably as well, are now outside of Ukraine, are in a different, in a different academic context, are uh, exposed to different sort of ideas. We know how the, the, the Western academia works. We know how difficult to get permanent positions. So most of them would come back, but they would come actually very different, very different people. And in that sense, the, the war will influence the historical profession, not only in just providing and demanding to write of new themes, providing new topics and new perspectives, but also just by, by, by changing the experience of people who are involved. Time for one more question. Uh, yes. Um, what, what hopes for Ukrainian counteroffensive? Can, can Ukraine, at least in a realistic goal, to restore the borders of pre 2014? Do you see a moment where there'll ever be a handshake between Zelensky and Putin? Or is that such a preposterous idea that it never seems to the way? It takes you away from the idea that could be negotiated. So uh, I just explained that I do prognosis for 100 years from now. <laughs> 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 
I mean, you're, you're asking about something that may already started. Uh, you know, what I can say that, uh, from, from the perspective of what happened before and what was written, is that uh, it, it will be a very important development. Uh, there is a huge challenge. Ukrainians, the Ukrainian armed forces, keep surprising us. After, after uh, February 24th, 2022, when there was a big negative surprise and shock of the war, most most of things that come from Ukraine are, are, um, are more positive than negative in the sense of ability, ability to understand. This new counteroffensive will deal with the challenges that none of the earlier ones dealt. So Ukrainians um, defeated, defeated Russians in the battle for Kyiv, basically using very skillfully the weapons that they had and, and the forests in those areas. They, they used geography very well at your song, uh, cutting communications and pushing them. They, they um, broke through the basically one line of defenses in Kharkiv region. And now they are facing a different situation where geography is not as helpful. And uh, also there are multiple layers of, of, of defense lines. So that's, that's a challenge. We don't know what will happen. The, 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 the previous cases that I described suggest that actually Ukrainians can use different factors to their advantage and keep, 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 keep it innovate. So there are good chances that they would be successful. If, if there is no success, uh, we discussed that in the, in the interview of this, uh, this relative in Guardian, again, the, the chances of um, some frozen conflict increase. Uh, if there is a success, the big, the big next question will be, we'll start with letter C, Ukraine. Because the, the success of the counteroffensive is Ukrainian armed forces moving to the Azov Sea would essentially turn and this, so the situation may be similar to the, what was happening with her song. Um, so a lot, a, a lot depends on that, on that uh, counteroffensive. Whether that, that's the last uh, big battle of the war, I, I, I wish it would be, but I'm not, I'm not too optimistic. So sometimes <laughs> I'm not. I'm, I'm, I'm not uh, 100% of the last year considered it. So I find everyone in Ukraine to hope for the best for what this is a result for a shorter war for the end of this war. Okay, well, we, we have us, I'm, I'm, uh, as the uh, British historian A.G.P. Taylor once said, uh, which I think applies to this situation of historians making uh, prophecies. Why should knowing where I come from tell me where I'm going to? <laughs> so, uh, thank you very much for all your questions, uh, and uh, thank you for your contribution. Uh, good luck with the book, and congratulations again, and over to the channel. Thanks, Richard. Well, yes, indeed, a very, very big thanks on behalf of the RHS, obviously to both our audiences, those of you in the room here, and to those of you online, and above all, obviously, to Sarah and Richard for this wonderful conversation. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>